Okay guys, I'm back after a short break and um, this, this should be an interesting part, the Bible chronology. This is this is the part that I'm probably the most interested in because we all know that the Bible's been sort of rewritten and done again and it would just be nice to get an objective point of view from someone who's studied it intensely. Um, apart from all the the Bible bashers or the the atheists, I'd like to hear somebody in the middle that's um, looking at it objectively. So this should be an interesting chapter, guys. Um, I'll continue. Sorry about the voice. I'm uh, got a wee bit of cold, but I felt the need. To, I had to finish this book. It's, it's irritating me. It's like a it's an itch I can't scratch. So I have to finish it before I can move on to other things. Right, anyway guys, Appendix A, Bible Chronology. Chronology has always been a vexed question in regards to the remote past and to date any period with certainty depends upon its synchronisation with the corresponding events which can be checked. For instance, the invasion of Julius Caesar, 54 BC, can be confirmed by other data. On the other hand, the alleged foundation of Rome as 755-753 BC has no tangible evidence to support it because it is dependent on Greek methods and nothing can be considered authentic before the, the Seleucid era of 312 BC and doubts have been raised whether it is not too, not too late. The German Egyptologist Dr Lepsius says truly enough that a chronology well arranged and established must always proceed from astronomy but it is a council of perfection rarely attained except in the case of Amenophis, or Menophrase, in whose period a fresh Sothic cycle came into existence. We know definitely that this happened in 1322 BC, just as we are aware that the cycle of 1461 years was completed in AD 139, and again in 1600. That of 1322-139 was called by the Alexandrian mathematician Theon the Epoch of Menophrase, otherwise Amenophis, having been named after him. Tacticus, referring to the same epoch, says that the phoenix bird appeared in the reign of Sesostris for the first time and he obtained his information from the priests who accompanied Germanicus on the occasion of his visit to Thebes. As the phoenix was a measurement of time based on the movement of the stars Sirius, Osiris, Sirius, by which, according to the myth, the bird lived for 1,461 years and then was reborn. We know from astronomy when Sesotaurus Amenophis lived and, correspondingly, also the period of Moses. As was shown at some length in my previous volume, the riddle of prehistoric Britain, the ancient Scottish zodiac called the Golspe Stone, gives approximately the same period of the Great Catastrophe. Was it the, the ancient Scottish zodiac called the Gold Space Stone? I've never heard of that, and I'm Scottish, guys. So we'll have a look at that. The Gold Space Stone. Gold Space Stone Shop. Arcadian Stone Exhibition and Gift Shop. It looks like it's an. Orkney Oh there's there's the gold space stone. I've actually I've I've taken images I think I think this stone is in the museum. There we go. The Golspe stone. Look, there's a carved stone ball. Der Gols... What the f... Is this in German? Where's the English version? Weird. There we go. 
Uh, I've, I've, I've actually got an image, I've, take, I've seen this in real life, this stone. I think it sits in the, uh, the Museum of Scotland, in my city. The Golsby Stone. From the riddle of prehistoric Britain. To decipher its meaning, it must be read from the top or head downwards, the summit being what the ancients termed the square of heaven. Square of heaven. The square of heaven, Par Amon or Pa, divided the heavens into four quarters and thus formed the square heaven. Horus or Apollo was guide of the northern horizon and was depicted in the form of a pole or pillar, i.e. the north pole of the heavens. Surmounted by a hawk as a guardian of Set, Horus Apollo is symbolised here by two hawks, heads at the northern extremity, woven into the design, and the pole is shown on either side. This is a Scottish stone, guys, so they're mentioning Horus and Apollo and ancient Scottish stones. Interesting. But um, I've, I've, I've got photographs of this in real life. And they still can't decipher them. Still don't know what they mean. Let's see. Right, where was I? Where was I? When come to other methods, chronology is most uncertain. Plutarch questioned the accuracy of the Olympiads, those four-year periods which he said were compiled by Hippias, the Elian, at a late age and rested on no positive authority. Hippias estimated his first Olympiad at 77 BC. 776 BC, whereas Eratosthenes, the Alexandrian sage, calculated at 884 BC, 108 years later. The Parian marbles are quite unreliable and returned the Decalion deluge as happening 752 years before the first recorded Olympiad, or 1528 BC. Hippias, some 200 years earlier than the Golspe Zodiac reveals, there is no opinion handed down among you by ancient traditions, said the priest of Seas to Solon. And Josephus says scathingly of the Greeks, Almost all which concerns the Greeks happened not long ago. Nay, one of may say of yesterday only. He questioned the antiquity of their cities, their arts and their laws, and sneered at their records. He doubted their settlements in Greece, but as far for the... But as for the place where the Greeks inhabit, 10,000 destructions have overtaken it and blotted out the memory of former actions so that they were ever beginning a new way of living and supposed that every one of them was the origin of their new state. But jo Josephus did not perceive the moat in his own eye, for Jewish chronology is totally unacceptable. Lepsius, vainly endeavouring to synchronise Bible and Egyptian dates, confesses that the Bible chronology after the exodus is false. As late as the Persian kings, it was 165 years later than the accepted period of contemporary history and only fell into line with other chronology from the Seleucid era of 312 BC. Rabbi Hanasi, AD 54, is said to have arbitrarily fixed the dates of earlier ages in the effort to give an impression of authenticity to it. It was an ingenious effort. So this author, um, he's kind of he sounds like a flat earther. He sounds like a flat earther, but there is can there is a lot of things that should be questioned from the past, and I think this author um, he even questions Shakespeare. He thinks it was uh, Bacon. Is it Richard Bacon? Is it Richard? Some Bacon. Richard Bacon. I think that's a, a TV <laughs> presenter, but uh, Bacon. He reckons Bacon done Shakespeare. Right. The creation was fixed at 4000 BC, after which exactly one third of that period, 1334 to three years, was denoted as the date of the flood. Then 365 years later exactly was appointed for the arrival of Abram into Canaan, followed by periods of the sojourn in Egypt and Canaan, calculated as 430 and 215 years respectively, the latter being exactly half of the other. These suspicions are not removed when he gave the date of the Exodus at 1334 BC, which alone 
has any basis in fact, and it would seem that the rabbis knew of this date, although it happens to be exactly one third of the period allotted for the creation. It leads to the supposition that the date of 1334 BC was the only authentic period they wished to establish and so worked backward and forward from that particular date. It must suffice to observe that the sole exception of the Exodus, all the dates before and after it are fictitious and possess no background at all. If we compare the dates on, an ast on astronomical data in the history of Manetho, the true order of outstanding events is as follows. Abraham's invasion of Canaan, 2160 BC. Expulsion of Hebrews under David from the Mismarite territories, 1649 BC. Solomon's reign, 1616 to 1576. The Exodus, 1324 to, 20, uh, to 23 BC. The Flood Epoch, 1322 BC. Reigns of Hezekiah, 1335 to 1306 BC. The flaws in the order of dates in Judean chronology are only explicable as a determination of the rabbinical compilers to the correct date, the era of Moses. The prophet of Jehovah to an age by tampering with true biblical history antedates it long before the rise of Israel and the institution of monarchy. There are ostensible errors as for instance where the compiler of Exodus describes the Israelites as having dwelt in Egypt for 430 years. Other passages in Exodus 16 to 20, Numbers and Genesis assign only four generations of Jacob's sons to Moses or five to Joshua, thus contradicting each other hopelessly. The twelve generations from Moses onwards are allotted exactly 40 years apiece, totalling thus 480 years, the period assigned from Exodus to the fourth year of Solomon. A leading Bible authority, the Reverend Dr. S. R. Driver, question the accuracy of these claims says, Now the fourth year of Solomon is equated with the 480th year from the Exodus. Bishop Usher, therefore, dating Solomon's reign, 1014 BC to 975 BC, placed the Exodus in 1491 BC. The call of Abraham in 2501 and the creation in 4004 BC. But those but the truth is, is that Solomon, like David, from his seventh year and those who followed, all preceded Moses and the Exodus up to the reign of Hezekiah, as, of course, to the time of the judges before them. Thus was chronology tampered with in order to give Moses an ancient authenticity for his new deity and cult, and so to supplant Abram. In order to give verisimilitude to the laws of Moses, the scribes in inter passages in many parts of the text as may be traced and invented the unkind claim as they had to do. That while Moses had given their own god to Jehovah, the kings reigning subsequently by their method with few exceptions had been disobedient and had indulged in idol worship for which they were punished by the wrath of the deity. They entirely reversed the true order of Bible chronology otherwise Jehovah would have been proved a somewhat unreliable deity. An interesting sidelight on the contemporary period of Moses in Bible his history was thrown by historian Lysimachus, who was bitterly assailed by Josephus accordingly. He stated that the founder of Jewry led the Hebrews out of Egypt in the reign of Pharaoh Bocorus due to an error which can be explained. Appion, the his historian, made a like error by stating that the Exodus took place in the first year of the 7th Olympiad, 752 BC, by Hippias list, for which statement Appian was angrily attacked by the Jewish historian. What exactly happened in that Lysimachus posed information which connected the period of Moses with that of Hezekiah and accepting the wrong estimates for Egyptian king era, confused Bocorus with Amenophis and attributed to the former monarch the events which related entirely to that of Amenophis. Appian, in like error, accepting that Lysimachus said that estimated the period of Bocorus. Tacticus fell into the same mistake when he says that Bocorus, at the breaking out of a, a plague, cleared the land in obedience to an oracle, which again relates to Amenophis, whose period cannot be questioned. Bocorus is tabulated as the last king of 
the Satite dynasty, which was supposed to be followed by an Ethiopian dynasty and had nothing to do with the Exodus. Egyptologists placed Bokoros at the last king of the 24th Satite dynasty, followed by an Ethiopian or Kushite dynasty, headed by Taharka or Tarhaka, who was contemporary of Hezekiah. These latter dynasties, as interpreted to us from the lists, often in complete disagreement with one another, owe a great deal to the Old Testament, which they are made substantially to agree and to modern interpretations of Assyrian script which can be moulded to mean anything pleasing to the transcriber. We cannot rely on them. Lepsius found his gross mistake of 165 years merely between the destruction of Solomon's temple at the fall of Jerusalem and the Seleucid era. Undoubtedly, the Persian dates, such as that of Cyrus, are confusing, so much so that Dr. Driver, in his learned commentary of the Book of Daniel, cannot recognise any Darius the Mede, who is put forward as the conqueror of Babylon, there is no room for such a ruler, he says, and here, again, whilst the Babylonian captivity was stated to have lasted 70 years, Josephus allows 182 years from the overthrow of Jerusalem to the first year of freedom granted by Cyrus. All these throw back the true date, but nothing can equal the amazing liberty taken by the compilers, who without a qualm placed the kings of Judah and Israel after Moses, and so entirely nullified the accuracy of the Bible chronology for doctrinal doctrinal or more correctly, political purposes. <clears throat> I will, however, content myself with one other aspect of the de deception inflicted on the world by the compilers of the Old Testament, which they claimed as divinely inspired. It is actually a record of this Saturnian age, which came to a termination to all intents and purposes of the great catastrophe or flood. Though Moses lived over a hundred years before the final collapse of the kingdom of Judah, he yet paved the way for the forcible introduction of the Mosaic cult through the Chaldeans of Babylon who had been won over to his policy, owing to the pressure used by the Persian kings and who were squeezing the Judean kings from the time of Josea and later Zedekiah, but acceptable to only a few, as Jeremiah makes clear. Josiah had attempted to toe the line, but human sacrifice, an essential feature to the worship of Molech, symbolised by a bull, persisted until the fall of Jerusalem. The last lingering belief in Baal, or Satan, was only destroyed by the force of arms by Nebuchadnezzar, who to achieve his end also overthrew the king and state. This Chaldean king made his city Borsipa, Bor, or Bar, suggestive of its relationship to Ur, the mother city, the more correct name for Babylon, the future city of the Dionysic faith. Thus was given birth to the myth which said that Cronus and Ammon fought a prolonged war with Dionysus, Jehovah, who defeated them and succeeded father Ammon, signifying the former predominance of this god Hermes, whose place the king of Babylon usurped. His name Nebuchadnezzar was a title or epithet signifying Nebo, the Chaldean prophet, Chad or Cad, i.e. Hermes, and Nezar or Nazar, otherwise the messenger, Cad or Gad, dwelling in Babylon. The Saturnian age commenced in the era of megalithic monuments and temples, idols and stone worship, incorporated the various stage, stages of the Bronze Age and terminated in the Iron Age, in which undoubtedly some parts of the world were far more advanced than others. It may be noted that Saturn was the principal deity of the Danai and at the time of the siege of Troy, according to the Iliad, as also in the Odyssey. We have the date of the Trojan War as 1184 BC, accepted by Aristosthenes, Apollodorus, Diodorus, Tatian, and Eusebius, but there are reasons to suppose that it was no other than a Greek version of the Oversea War of Cesotorus and occurred about 150 years earlier. If we accept Manetho, Sesotris returned from this overseas invasion, bringing prisoners from Babylon. This was followed by a hundred years later by Hercules' return to Greece, which coincides with the date of the Trojan invasion of Britain, as appears in our own annals. annals. Dr. Waddell, in his Phoenician Origin of Britain and Scots, gives the date of the Trojan arrival as 1103 BC, 
and substantiates it with a complete list of British kings from then onwards with lengths of reigns until the Roman invasion and thus offers testimony not to be ignored. If the Saturnian age finally collapsed in the 12th century BC, how is it possible for such alert people as the Judeans to have been unaware of serpent rods before the 8th century BC and to have continued to worship Saturn or Moloch until the 6th century? I contend that the evidence proves that with the destruction of Jerusalem and the final overthrow of Egypt by Nebuchadnezzar, it ended that age and brought in that of Dionysus or Jehovah or Thor. Those who take the trouble to study the Egyptian dynasty list will find much in doubt after the 19th, dynast 19th Ramses dynasty. Following Ramses III, there follows a long list of nonities, all named Ramses, down to number 17 of that ilk. The 21st dynasty of Tanites, 22nd of Bobasid, Bubba Stites, 23rd Tanites and 24th Saites possess no single king of whom history knows anything at all unless we accept Bokorus succeed, succeeded by Ethiopians under Terhaka, becoming a cognate with the supposed periods of Hezekiah and chronologically inaccurate. There are no synchronising dates to set against all these inverting dynasties, and thus in modern calculations, the experts of Egyptian and Assyrian inscriptions can enjoy a heyday in bolstering up one another. The Trojan dynasty of Britain, Appendix B. Ooh. I think I'll continue. Okay. The dispersion of the Aryans has always been a somewhat obscure puzzle, mainly because students, unaware of the causes, were unable to assess the immense movements at a certain epoch of the mass immigration of vast numbers of people. This work has been attempted to advance an explanation of the cause, the period of immense wars of conquest, the emigration of certain races, enslavement of others taken to foreign lands, leading finally to the great catastrophe followed by a re resultant change in climate compelling many to seek flight to more southern lands, more noticeably in certain northern parts than in others. Thus, we may trace some who moved to the southwest like the so-called Origanations, Magdalenians, Azilians and others who sought refuge in the caves of the Dordong, and yet others who, em who migrated to the east and southeast. The Assyrians in Iraq should prove to have been Goths from the north, led thither by Zalmoxis or Moses, who was ambiquitous. Nevertheless, when a couple of hundred years or less, there proceeded the steady counter-infiltration of new populations or descendants of the old into the deserted lands, including the British Isles, which had recovered from the blows inflicted upon their face, and whose fertility was a source of great attraction to those seeking pastures new. In addition to these which large areas were deserted and without inhabitant, or those who still dwelt in Britain could offer little resistance to the newcomers. There was a return of the Dorians to Greece, who, with the Heraclides, became the masters of Peloponnes, as Thucydides states, 80 years after the fall of Troy. It should be mentioned that, in the opinion of Dr. Waddell, the Dorians and Trojans were one and the same, he draws attention to the rough simplicity and free use of vowel sounds of the Doric tongue and other traces which relate them to the Scandinavian family of nations. Of the Heraclides, I have adduced much both in my former work and in this to prove their intimate relationship with Britain and Ireland and the Scottish Western Isles from the remotest times, so there is no need to enter into further details. As regards the Trojans, we have the classic evidence of Virgil of how the Trojan hero Aeneas sailed to Hellas by the way of the Cyclades and was blown by a southwest gale to the island of Crete, on whose soil the gods had forbidden him to land, a voyage which appears by corrected topography to have proceeded from the region of Denmark along the English Channel, up the west coast of the Hebrides and thence on to Shetland. Whence, we may perhaps presume, he rounded northern Scotland until he reached his final destination. How closely the Dorians of Greece were related to the Trojans may remain a moot point, but their coming to Hellas or Scotland, synchronised with the period of arrival of the latter, the unusual date given, 1103 BC, 
Both Dorians and Trojans worshipped the Hyperborean Apollo, and further example of the Dorian Northern connection was the reindeer or unicorn was the emblem of the, Lacedo the Lacedaemonians, which was dedicated traditionally to Artemis by Tegate, one of the Pallades, mother of Lacedaemon. The name of Dor is not unconnected with the northern god Thor. So, Dor and Thor could be the same. Dorians, Dor. Hyperborean. Interesting. Changes there were in plenty in those times. Tyrant succeeded tyrant, but yet numbers clung with desperate attachment to the motherland, even though they were forced to conceal themselves in caves in the mountains or in caverns by the seashore. Amongst these invaders, we should especially consider the Trojans or Phrygians who came. It would seem, in various comparatively small bodies at this date from 1103 BC, some 347 years before the founding of Rome, to understand who they were requires a new orientation and outlook, for they were no more a racial type from the Hellas point in Asiatic Turkey than that the Saxons originated from Iraq. They were a northern European people, dwelling on the northern shores of the continent. I labour in the hope that one day scholars will realise that Europe, not Asia, was the main stage in which all antiquity, classic and Bible was played out. A passage of the Iliad offers a clue to their original home, wherein Homer describes the Hellespontine Phrygians as denizens by far Ascanias Aske, Askin, Lake with Phroises joined. Now, Phroises, is, it is known, was a variation of Orcus, the equivalent of Hades in the Uranid pantheon. Phroises belong to the Atlantean group of deities or monsters. Who's this? Forces. P-H. I've never heard of that one. P-H-O-R-C-Y-S. Forces. Let's see how it's. Greek mythology, Forces, Forcus, is a primordial sea god, generally cited first in Hesiod as the son of Pontus and Gaia. According to the Orphic hymns, Porces, or Forces, Cronus and Rhea were the eldest offspring of the Oceanus and Tethys. Classical scholar Carol Karenia conflates Forsyth with the similar sea gods of Nereus and Proteus. His wife was, was Seto and is most notable in the myth for fathering by Seto, a host of mo monstrous children. In extant Hellenistic Roman mosaics, Forsyth was depicted as a fish-tailed merman with crab claw four legs and red spiked skin. Hesiod's Theogony lists the children of Forces and Cato as the Grey, the Grae, naming only two, Penfredo and Enyo, the Gorgons, Stethno, Uriel and Medusa, probably Ecdina. Through this text is unclear to this point, and Seto's youngest, the awful snake who guards the apples of all gold in the secret places of the dark earth at his great bounds, also called the Dracon Hesperios, Hesperian dragon, or dragon of the Hesperides, or Ladon. Hesperides, that sounds like Hebrides. These children tend to be consistent across sources, though Ladon is often cited as a child of e Echidna by Typhon, and there, therefore Forces and Cato's grandson. According to Apollodorus, Scalia was the daughter of Curtius, with the father being either Trenius, Triton, or Forsus, a variant of Forces. Apollonius of Rhodes had Scylla as the daughter of Forces and a conflated Critias he Hecate. And there's a the family tree. Interesting. 
Homer refers to Thusa, the mother of Polyphemus, as daughter of forces. And there's the man himself. Crab people. That's what that's what reminds me of the <laughs> the crab people from the South Park episode. Look, he's got a he's got a a torch there. He's like the bringer of light as well. He's got something else in his hand. Like food. Crazy, crazy. But what was also said there reminded you of the Adam and Eve story. Who was it? Something to do with garden apples or... Anyway, now forces, as it is known, was a variation of Orcos, the equivalent of Hades in the U Uranid pantheon. Forces belonged to the Atlantean group of deities or monsters who was reputed to carry off men to the lower world and to keep them imprisoned there, which was possibly a folklore memory of subterranean temples for magic rites. And I was watching uh, the new King Arthur last night as well, guys, and the, the evil king to get more power he had to go down to the, this underwater cavern and offer sacrifices to these monsters in the water they were half human half like women like witches three three of them so these these stories sort of continue in our, our movies and culture Forces or Orcus son of Oceanus and Guy the Earth was the mythical parent of Gorgons and Greyei, the first belonging to the notorious witches with the serpents for hair, who taught magic to Pers Perseus and Belif Bellerophon. The Grey being aged three crones who possessed only one tooth between them and borrowed it from each other in order to be able to eat, probably reminiscent of the three aged Druidesses who directed some oracle shrine. Auricular shrine. Forces also father the dragon Laden, a fiery monster who guarded the golden apples. There we go. Laden. This this in like a this is in, this in like a Adam and Eve story. Laden was a serpent like dragon that twined and twisted around the tree in the garden of the Hesperides and guarded the golden apples. That just sounds like the serpent in the the Garden of e Eve. Uh, Eden, sorry. Eve. Adam and Eve. He was overcome by Hercules. The following day, Jason and the Argonauts passed by on their Chthonic return journey from Colchis and heard the lament of the shining eagle, one of four Hesperides, and viewed the still watching Laden. Hesperides. In Greek mythology, the Hesperides are the nymphs of evening and golden light of sunset who were the daughters of the evening or nymphs of the west. They tend a blissful garden in a far western corner of the world, located near the Atlas Mountains in North Africa, at the edge of the encircling Oceanus, the world ocean. According to the Sicilian Greek poet Stescorus in his poem the song Geryon, and the Greek geographer Strabo, in his book Geographica, Volume 3, the Garden of Hephspredes is located in Tartessos, a located place in the south of the Iberian Peninsula. By ancient Rome times, the Garden of Hesperides had lost its archaic place in religion and had dwindled to a po poetic convention, in which form it was revived in re Renaissance poetry to refer both to the garden and to the nymphs that dwelt there. Um, I think it was... <laughs> Revived in the Bible, to be honest with you, before re the Renaissance. <clears throat> right, back to the book. Forces, also father of the dragon laid on a fiery monster who guarded the golden apples of the Hesperides, a tale to be linked with the tree of knowledge and the serpent. All of being a cycle of myths which brings forces 
into the orbit of the Uran Uranids. Geographically, he may pl be placed at Orkney Island, or as in Cave Ness opposite, for the Orkneys were known of old as the Orcades, Isles or of Orcus, or Forsides, Isles of, Isles of Forkies. To these terrestrial parts of Orkneys, the ancient De Danan tribe of the Hebrides in Ulster, the true Heracleids, I would recall, gave the name Dorcade or Diorcade, the Celtic Hades, from whence they said the Iberes fled into Ireland, thus recalling Tacitus' allusion to the Jews' flight from Crete to Libya, Ireland. In effect, therefore, Homer, speaking of forces as one extremity of a lake or body of water, namely the northeast of Scotland, balanced it within the Acania at the other extreme. At this other or southern end was Ascania's lake, the present North Sea, now greatly widened since the early ages, where lay Ascania, formerly Denmark, yet named also as Scania or Scania, including parts of Sweden, whence the name Scandinavia. Here adjoining the present Denmark dwelt originally the Phrygians and Hellespontine Phrygians, the Hellespont answering to the present Kattegat, bordering on the North Sea with the mouths of the Rhine, although since the days of Christianity the seas have encroached into a tremendous extent on the shores of the lower countries of Scandinavia. And this is where we're talking about Dopper land, guys. This is where the missing land is. And it's, and it's a real thing. It's not just... Um, they reckon there was land there because they found the remains of villages under the sea in the North Sea, in the Channel. Um, the name of Hellespont is possibly preserved in connection with the name of the strange little island of Heligoland, the one perhaps signifying the Sea of Hell or Hades, the other the route to the said region of Hell. Denmark and Hanover face the sea, which at its furthest part, furthest northern extremity in the land of Orcas or Forces, Forces, so confirming the words of Homer. The southern province adjoining Ascania, the Ashkenazim of the scriptures, acquired the name of Messiah or Moesia, ostensibly so named after Moses, who made it a centre of his doctrine. In the region called Messia were such names beside the Trod as the Moreni, Tuthrenia and Pergamus, and all those previously mentioned, Phrygia, Hellespontine, Phryg Hellespontine Phrygia, Lake Ascania, and the Trode, where stood the city of Troy or Ilium, all of which names are found placed in the classic atlas or su situated in an Anatolian Turkey. A puzzled contributor to Sir William Smith's classical dictionary admits that Ascania or Ashkenaz was related to Scandinavia, which is a tantamount to the admission to the rest should follow suit. All or none, and so they do, Hellespontine Phrygia became Denmark, and Phrygia incorporated the territories west of the Albus River, Greek Hals, now the Elbe, and as far as the Rhine. In Charlemagne's time it was named Frisia, with Saxonia on its west. Earlier, Belgica, Frisia, formerly Phrygia, incorporating Denmark, Hanover and the Netherlands, thus forming the later Frank Empire of Charlemagne. As for Troy or Ilium, let us recollect that it was traditionally founded by Teucer and Scamander, both being Iliods of Crete, who took Apollo Smintheus with them, and they formed their colony on the mainland. In spite of effusive claims that made in the last century of behalf of the German grocer Schgeliman, at a time when Victorians paid foolish adulation to all German erudition, there was never a vestige of evidence beyond wishful thinking to support the boast that the runes he found at Hisarolic in Asia Minor were those of Troy. To discover its true sight, one must look into the direction of the former Frisia, who out, whose outlying isles are still called the Frisian Isles, a location supported not merely by nomenclature, nomenclature but by other circumstances. Scandinavian Eddas claims that Odin was king of Troy, and so he termed the, the Prosa Edda, the later Edda says that Troy was built by the sons of Bor, Bar, who raised the altars and temples in the Eidaval. And in my previous work, as well as in this, I produced reasons to show that the sons of Bor, or Bar, were originally the Uranids or Chaldeans of Ur, 
in turn, the Cretans or Chaldeans of the Shetlands and Orkneys. In other words, the Scandinavian ancient annals confirm the classic traditions, and we have further confirmation of this that the first colonizing Cretans carried the name of their sacred Mount Ida to Troy, thus a daughter of Ur of the Chaldees. I have pre previously suggested that the strange cycle of legends respecting Moses, Zalmoxus, Zoroaster and Selenus find their culmination in Odin. And uh, Odin, see this name here? Sorry guys, I'll, I'll stop reading the book now, but Odin, there was, a, there was an old tribe, recently I made a video up in uh, the Pentland Hills, and there was an old prehistoric fort, Iron Age fort, um, and they reckon it was a tribe called the God Odin, the God Odin, God Odin, um, which I find, if you break it down, the God Odin, it's God Odin, you say it in one word, God Odin, I'll actually, I'll, I'll show you guys. I'll show you guys. Instead of just talking a bit, I'll show you. There we go, guys. The god Odin. You can see here. They ruled. They ruled almost like the the area that that was called Northumbria, and um, parts of Scotland down to the northern England. But here you can see the God Odin tribe. The God Odin, Welsh pronunciation, Go Dodin, were a P Celtic speaking Britonic people of the north eastern Britannia, the area known as the Hen Ogled, or Old North, modern southeast Scotland and the north east England, in the sub Roman period. Descendants of the Votadini, they are best known as the subject of the 6th century Welsh poem, Why God Odin, or Yigog. Ye Gododin, which memorialises the Battle of Castreth and is attributed to Aneirin. See, I'm going to look into these battles because you never hear about these tribes in mainstream culture. We get, we, get, we, get, we get handed William Wallace and just, that's it, there's your history. There's William Wallace, there's Robert the Bruce, there you go. Nothing, nothing else happened. The name Gododin is modern Welsh form, but the name appeared in Old Welsh as Gutodin, there's still Odin there, and derived from the tribal name Votadini, recorded in classical sources such as Greek texts from the Roman period. So even the Greeks were aware of these people, the god Odin, and this is where, this is where I live. So this is a good thing about this book, like after reading it, I could actually visit sites that might be related to it. who overran the north with his invading Azermen, and that these, consumed with berserk rage, and they slaughtered their enemies at a distance, went mad and bit their shields, or seemed to do so in their fury, may be regarded as no other than the legendary Selenai, while Odin himself was looked upon by many as Scan Scandinavian legend state, as a sorcerer and false prophet, who, like Moses or Zaramoxus, was wont to disappear for long periods. This compels me to revert briefly to the overseas wars of Sesostris, who took his fleets and armies to conquer the lands in the north, and who brought back, among others, according to Manetho, Babylonian prisoners. We saw confirmation of this war in the Picts of Caledonia. Complaints that they were chased out of their own country by out of their own country, Scythia, by one prince of Egypt called Agenor. I'll, I'll, I'll say it in English, but this is Ain, Ain Prince of Egypt, Kalet, Agenor. That just means one prince of Egypt called Agenor. A noteworthy literary controversy arose at the end of the 18th century when classic subjects, intrigued by the educated classes far more than nowadays, that the Trojan War was really a contest between Egypt and Troy. The main protagonist of this view was Joseph Bryant, who set out his views in a work entitled dissertation of the War of Troy and contended, among other arguments, that Agamemnon, king of Argos, whose prefix signify merely the brave or noble Memnon, was actually the Egypto-Ethiopian king Memnon, who had been identified as Sesostris. P. 
Bryant cited Diodorus in the effect that the Iliad was a garbled memory of an Egyptian campaign and that Homer acquired the information from a poem written on the Trojan War by Fantasia, a priestess of Memphis. Bryant was disputed but by no means refuted and the circumstances of this war in which, whilst the Trojans were ultimately defeated, the Greeks suffered the most disastrous sequel with the country plunged into chaos and situations whereby few of the heroes ever returned to their homes. Agamemnon himself, who did, being betrayed and murdered by his queen and her paramour, are all very reminiscent of Sesostris and the aftermath of his war with the Scythians. Troy, it may be recalled, did not come to its end with the defeat and murder of King Priam. For some two centuries or less later, the Trojan chiefs invaded the lands in the same way as the Assyrians invaded and defeated Egypt, Tyre and Judah. The inference, the inference it is possible to draw from the foregoing is that Troy, built by the sons of Bor and Bar, hence of Cretan Chaldean origin, was the same city of Babylon, also known as Bor Sipa, the one being the classic and the other being the biblical designation. The name Babylon, moreover, signified probably rather the city of Chaldean Papa, such of such as the papal city is descriptive of Rome and that Troy or Ilium was its correct name. In a certain passage, Herodotus relates how Messians and Tush, Tucrians from Phrygia invaded Hellas, proceeded to the river Peneus and the Ionian Sea after crossing the Bosphorus and landing in Thrace. We need not regard this as a raid from Asia Minor into Greece, but rather as a sally from Frisia crossing the North Sea into Perthshire and, and from thence into Argyleshire by the way of the river Spin and the Lochs Linnae to the Hebridean Ionian Sea, a name yet preserved in the island of Iona of so great fame the sites can be identified. The learned 18th century antiquarian writer Thomas Baxter describes the Phrygians as those who early became masters of almost all Western Europe, stating that they used the names of Bridges, Brudges of Phrygies, Phrygies, he claims that the Brig Brigantes of Britain, the most numerous and powerful people in England at the time of the Roman conquest, were of that race. He related them to the Phoenicians and said that they called themselves Britas, later Britons or Brittany. The Brigantes, the Trojan settlers in Britain, claimed descent from Gad, otherwise the Chaldeans or Phoenicians, all of the same kindred. The same, the name Brigai or Brigi takes us back to Herodotus, who in a certain passage says that the Phrygians claim to the oldest civilised people, but the Brigai of Mas Macedonia and Thrace said that the Phrygians were descended from them and took the name Phrygian later. These Brigai can be traced to northern eastern Scotland to Caledonia, and it's not difficult to realise that some colonists originally made their way to the shores of what we now call Denmark and Hanover, and perhaps made their first settlement on the banks of the River Elbe or on the mouths of the Rhine. On the Eob, Latin Albus, is the Hansitic city of Hamburg, whose name suggests the city of Ham or Ammon, and if place names afford evidence, was related to the Cushites or Chaldeans or Caledonians of Scotland, a name further recalled by Cruxhaven, Cuxhaven, the name of Hamburg's port, the port of Cush. We may read the Bible allusion with fresh eyes, and Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth, and the beginning of the kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalne, in the land of Shinar. It must not, that was Genesis, it must not be tied to any suggestion that either Troy or Babylon necessarily lay where is Hamburg, for it is conjectural. Phrygia, later Frisia, is another matter, farthest west in the ancient port of Bruges, preserving the name Brigai in the region of Belgi, also did the Morin dwell in Mysia and the Moroni of Caesar at the mouth of the Rhine. In Mysia lived the Tuchthrenes or Tuthrenes, claiming descent from Tusa. It is mere coincidence that the Tuchthani or Tenchtheri lived not far from Treves and were decimated by the Romans at the confluence of the Mosa and Rhine. The incorrect or varied spelling of the proper place names is not infrequent in Caesar. Another, day, another city in the region of Mysia was 
Pergamus, a great city celebrated for its fabrics and its arts, and off the Pergamene coast lay a number of famous islands which correspond with the Frisian Isles. It was a pagan cathedral city, a universal town, and the royal residence of its kings were the throne of Satan. Here Dionysus, Aphrodite, and Esculapius were especially worshipped. It became an early seat of Christianity, one of the seven churches of Asia in, in the apostrophes. The Pergamon king descended from Attalus, allied themselves with the Romans, and Attalus III made Rome his heir. There is reason to believe that Pergamus may be sought as a later Cologne, where the Romans planted the colony in AD 51 and made it Colonia. In a curious work, three kings of Cologne are named Melchior, Balthasar, and Jasper. Messia was a regional name for of unexplained origin, which embraced generally Phrygia, Lydia, and other regions mentioned. The river Mosa, a muse, like the name Moseli, seems to have been related to it, and this comprehensive title of the region may well have been taken from Moses, signifying the territories where he showed so much activity in his manoeuvres in Phrygia and Lydia. As to Treves, that ancient city on the banks of Moselle, it seems justified, justifiable to connect it with the Assyrians. On the Rotes Hoss in the city of the centre, in the centre of the city, a late Gothic building of 1450 is a proud claim inscribed in the 17th century which reads Ante Roman Treveris Stetit Annus MCCC a declaration that Treves was built 1300 years before Rome. This claim was based on a local tradition that was founded by Trebeta, son of the early Assyrian monarch Ninus, the builder of Nineveh and the husband of the famous Semiramis. To complete was Nineveh's fall at a date ascribed to 606 BC but definitively earlier that the very site and name appeared from human ken until Layard claimed its discovery in Iraq last century yet in Belgium, not far distant whether coincidence or not the name still survives in the town called Nineveh not far from Brussels if there was a vestige of proof of Layard's correct identification how came these Assyrian traces so many thousands of miles distant from it and where they fit in naturally with the rest. The Treviri, the Treviri or the Trevari, both names appearing Caesar, were one of the most powerful of the Belgic tribes who spoke a Celtic tongue and in the opinion of Ridgeway were related to the Cumbri. Thus may we trace some of the lost past in which Europe, not Asia, was the true theatre of ancient world events. I might enlarge on the subject to include the Medes or Persians whose traces are to be found throughout Europe and even Britain. It is logical, logically preposterous to believe that these powerful and civilised states were dwelling in the largely unfertile and desert tracts of Middle Asia, even though they also ruled in the period of the, that vast slave-ridden empire. Now we return to the search for the Trojans and first examine what Josephus makes of the Ascanians or Hellespontine Phrygians. They were, he states, descendants of Jeff Japheth, sons of Gomer, who were the founder of Galatiae, or Gauls, or Cimmerians. Of the three sons of Gomer, Ashkenax founded the Ashkenaxians, now called the Reginians by the Greeks. So did Ripa found the Rephians, now called the Paphologians, and the Thrugama, who were named the Phrygians. Before examining into Ashkenaxians or Ascanians, a brief epotomy of the other two will indicate the probable locality of their settlements. The Riffians or Riffi of Norway dwelt by the Riffia or Hyperborean mountains, whose lofty and snow-clad heights in the direction of Hammerfest still bear the name of Ripa's mountains. West of them were the Cimmerians, according to the Argonautica of Orpheus and Palfalgonia, whence some of them settled were known as Enetai. Example, Venetai, Phoenicians may be located in Pomerania between the Vistula and Old Oder rivers. The Phrygians, as shown, living in the later Frisia, were situated on their west. How comes it that the Ascanians came to be named Reginians? Because when they migrated from Hellespont Phrygia, or from the Rhine, they settled in Rigium as part of Gratia Magna or Illyria. 
later named Britum after Brutus, subsequently Britain. We find it placed in classic maps in the toe of Italy, although it was really a part of Greek Illyria in the north, when the descendants of these Ascanians found, eventually founded Rome, 75 BC, 755 BC, sorry. They had previously dwelt in Regium and Albania for over 300 years. Where then was Regium? To seek it one must search, not in the Mediterranean Sea, but look to the peninsula of Wigget Townshire in the Scottish lowlands, called the Rins of Galloway, nearest point to the Isle of Man. The Rins include in all Galloway and Kirk, Cudbrightshire, and part of Cumberland, once bore the name of Rahaged, Reged, 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 Reged. In the spacious days of King Arthur, Sir Owen, one of his most famous knights from these those parts, was the son of Urien, Prince of Ra Ragged. This part of Britain, with a prehistoric pedigree as Ragged, Latinized into Reg Regium, became a focal point of the invading Trojans who set up the kingdom of Alba or Albany, to this day a royal dukedom, and subsequently termed the kingdom of Strathclyde. The Welsh triads, setting forth three pillars of the nation, included first Hugardarn, and next in order, Fredain, Brutus, son of Aed the Great, Aeneas, who organised a social state and sovereignty in Britain. What more? Ends Britain, page 350. In the early Saxon chronicle are mentioned the Britas as the earliest inhabitants of Brighton, except for the Picts, except for the Picts and Scots. Yet these Britas were nevertheless termed Welas, originally signifying strangers. These records Records point to the first institution of the Trojans or Phrygians or Ascanians in Regid, in the nearest parts opposite Ireland, the former a part of the Kingdom of Albany in the ancient Scottish Chronicle and De Situ Albany, AD 496. Alba, Albania or Albany was described as extending from Mons Dromalban, Bredalbane Mountains, to the Mare Hiberne, Irish Sea, and Inch Gal, Galloway. The Rhines being called Inch, the Isle of Peninsula of the Gauls, Ritz and Annals, page 25. The ruling king at this time was Fergus Mac Erk. Fergus, son of the descendant of Hercules. Another version, mentioned by Watmore, describes the kingdom of Albany as beyond Bredalbane to Inchgall and Sharag Muna. The sole way forth. Thus is confirming the settlement of the Ascanians or Trojans in Ragged, now Galloway, stretched northwards to the borders of Persia, and it may be mentioned in passing that the Tudor kings, Tudor kings claimed the descendant from the Trojans. Right, we'll have a wee look at Fergus Mac Erk. Fergus. Was it Mac Erk? Uh, Erk. Oh, jeez, caps. So there's two Fergus. Fergus Moore Mac Erk. Fergus Moore Mac Erka. English, Fergus the Great, was allegedly king of Dalratia. He was the son of Erk of Dalradia. While his hist historicity may be debatable, his posthumous importance was the founder of Scotland and the national myth of medieval and Renaissance Scotland is in no doubt. Rulers of Scotland, from Sinead MacAlpin until the present time, claim descent from Fergus Mor. The historical record, such as it is, consists of an entry in the Annals of Tigernach of the year 501, which states Fergus Mor Mac Erka, come gentil da Riada, partem Britannia, tenute et ibi mortius est. Fergus Mor Mac Erk, with the people of Dalretia, held part of Britain and he died here. However, the forms of Fergus, Erk, and Dalretia are later ones, written down long after the 6th century. The record of the Annals has given rise to theories of invasions of Argyll from Ireland, but these are not considered authentic. Right guys, I'm going to have a quick 
two minute break five minute break sorry back in a minute Right, I'm back people, quick wee break there, try and finish this book off today, hopefully, I think there's only about 30 or 20 pages or something left, so I'll have a quick look at chat, in fact, see who's there, so who's there, we've got Hoodwink, nice one, Mr. Draco, D-Truth, Mark Ainsworth, nice, there's a book called Finding Merlin that talks about the God Odin, the book traces Merlin to be a druid living in Scotland. Interesting, interesting indeed. Right, the Trojans, okay. A claim, right, let's see. The Tudor cling the Tudor kings claimed the descent from the Trojans, a claim which the English historian Grote ridiculed and said that others, including the Franks, made a like claim. Justly so did they, and Grote's error was due to his complete misinterpretation of classic geography. There su survives a quaint poem of the Dalreads, erst descendants of the Argives who ruled in Argyll, Ulster, and the Hebrides, and who, as Argives, were anciently so famous in Greek lore, it affects to teach the Albans, or Trojans, their own history. It runs thus. Ye learned of all, Alban, ye wise yellow-haired race, learn who first acquired the districts of Alban. Albanus acquired them with all his race, illustrious son of Isocon, Ascanius, brother to Britus without treachery, from his Alban of ships takes his name. Britus expelled his interpreted brother over the sea of Ict. Britus acquired illustrious Alban to the lands of Fegnac, Father Dane. The lands of Fegnac, Father Dane, are applied by Waddell to the Ot Otadini territories, Father Dane, who occupied the counties of Roxburgh and Berwick, adjoining Galloway and Dumfries. The motif is, however, not a friendly one in this poem. It accuses Brutus of having wrong, wrongfully seized the territory of Alba or Albany from Albanus, son of Ascanius, 
and of having driven him across the Sea of Ict, the Sea of the Picts, or North Sea. The Dalred poem is of value because it is disdainfully ignores the very idea of any other Alba than the settlement of the Ascanians, who traditionally, under Ascanus, built Alba Longa, and whose descendants became the later founders of Rome. And this is, I'll put in Alba, guys, but this is what Scotland was known as. Alba. We actually have it on our, we did have it on our um, national soccer strip, or football strip, as we call it in Scotland. Alba is a Scottish Gaelic name for Scotland. It is cognate with Alba, Alban, Albane, in Irish and Nalban, and Manx, the two other Rodelic, insular Celtic languages, as well as contemporary words used in Cornish, Alban and Welsh, Yer Alban, both of which Brit Britonic, insular Celtic languages. The third surviving Britonic language, Breton, uses Broscos, meaning country of the Scots. In the past, these terms were the names of Great Britain as a whole, related to the Brythonic name Alba, Albion. There you go. There you go, people. Right. It should be observed that the Roman historians fail to recognise any Brutus, the Predain of the triads, but they agreed that Aeneas, Aed, Aeneas, Aed the Great, was the father of of Ascanius, whose son Al Albanus, Brutus, was accused of driving away by the Dalriads. Ascanius, in turn, was succeeded in Alba longer by his son Alba Silvius, accorded the name Silvius because he was born in sight of Silva, the forest. Ascanius, also named Latanus, built Alba longer, which is certainly nothing what's, what, whatever in common with the pleasant and aristocratic suburb of Rome where the later Europe emperors and their nobles erected splendid and ornate villas of all which bore the same name of Al Albanum. With these facts to guide us, it follows that the original Alba Longa was situated in Britain and in the kingdom of Alba near Brut Brutium. In tiny Clack Manon, a country of itself, stands the ancient town of Alva or Alba, placed on the slopes of the Ockle Hills, a centre of ancient settlement with many druidic standing stones in its vicinity. Alva lies adjoining the former Great Caledonian Forest, with Hector Boss, the medieval Scots historian, saying, began in the neighbourhood of Stirling nearby and stretched to the very north of Caledonia, the home of wild beasts and largely impenetrable. Here is the Silva, and not far beyond the Alva are the Bredalbane Mountains. Their name derived from Alba. Thus could it be said that Salvius was born in the site of the forest, but was Alva, the same as Alba. Nennius, a highly regarded early authority, after saying that the British kings of Alba called their dynasty after Silvius, thus proceeds. Brutus subdivided the lands of Britain, whose inhabitants were the descendants of the Trojans, from Silvius Posthumus. His mother was Lavinia. He was called Silvius, from whom the kings of Alba were called Silvan. He was a brother of Brutus. Posthumus reigned among the Latins. I suggest on the evidence that Alva, the ancient little capital of Clackmannan, was the seat of the earliest Latin kings and was the Alba Longa of Ascanius. If I were to enter more largely into this particular region, it would be shown that Fifeshire and part of Persia were, were originally part of the Epirus and Outer Greece, as conforms with the earlier identification of Hellenic sites and where the Trojans traditionally settled after leaving Troy. Crazy guys, crazy. So I think the author is kind of saying that the these Greek stories are based in Europe as well. Never mind the the Bible. It's, it's crazy, crazy stuff. The name of the Trojans adopted for the new country Alba and hence Albinus had no known Phrygian origin like Ascanius and as fre frequently puzzled students, was possibly derived from on or near the river Albus, 
Now the Elbe suggestion that nearby the river was the capital Troy or Ilium, but I must content, content myself by continuing with the Trojan settlements in Britain. Recollecting that the Frigians were said to have been originally Brigies or Brigai, we have Baxter's claim that the Brigantes of England, with their later capital at York, Brigi or Ghent's race of people, were the people of the Brigai or Brigi. Bothius says that they came from the Ragged or the Rigium or Galloway when he says above Nidisdale, Nisdale is Galloway, named Brigantia. Although when Ptolemy prepared his geography of Britain, he placed the Brigantes from Westmoreland to Yorkshire inclusive. The Brigantes spread southwards and eventually lost Albany in the north, part of it becoming the Strathclyde Kingdom. But all the same, Ptolemy calls the reigns of Galloway Nova Novantarium prom Tomorium, the Novante Peninsula, and its inhabitants the Novante, the newcomers, the Welias or strangers, dwellers next, the Selgovi, Solway, and Otadini of Roxburghshire. This name, Novante, may be compared with the Trojan Novantum, built traditionally by Brutus or, according to Virgil, by Helenus, a seer, son of Priam, who married Adromache, or Adromaca the widow of Hector, who settled in Caiona, a Caonia, in this Epirus, a land of oaks, where he built Bathortis, describes as a miniature Troy. The Epirus, also Ill Illyria, were f originally in these parts of Britain, stretched from the mouth of the Forth to Cumberland and beyond. Albania, or Albany, was carved out of the Epirote lands and Brutinum, Brutium, was not only part of Albany, but was originally Illyria, or Silurian territory. Regium, the original set settlement of the Trojans, apart from Alba Longa, was said to lie in the Sicilian Strait, where formerly locked those mythological monsters, Scylla and Carbidus, in whose clutches Od Odysseus suffered shipwreck and the life of his crew were returning from the Trin Trinacria, the third-headed island, later called Scania or Sicily. I suggest that the Mediterranean Sicily has and can have no connection at all with these traditions, and that the real Trinacria, with its three outstanding headlands, was the Isle of Man. And that's, that's crazy, guys, because when you think of the Isle of Man uh, badge, the, the, the flag... The flag of the Isle of Man, it's three legs. It's three running legs. Let's see. Where, where was I before? Was the Isle of Man once in, infinitely larger, which possesses more remote antiquities than any other equal given in the area of the British Isles? Isle of Man. You can see here it's, a, it's quite a large island. But you can see the flag. Here's the flag, the coat of arms. It's got three legs. Looks like there's a hawk and a, a raven. That gives you the general idea of its location. The Isle of Man, Manx, Ellen Vannon, also known simply as Man, is a self-governing and crown dependency in the Irish Sea between the islands of Great Britain and Ireland. The head state is Queen Elizabeth II, who holds the title of Lord of Man and is represented by Lieutenant Governor. Foreign relations and defences are the responsibility of the British government. The island has been inhabited since before 6500 BC. Gaelic cultural influences began in the 5th century and the Manx language, a branch of the Gaelic languages, emerged. In 627, Edwin of Northumbria conquered the Isle of Man along with most of Mercia. In the 9th century, Norsemen established the Kingdom of the Isles. Magnus III, King of Norway, Norway was also known as King of Man and the Isles between 1099 and 1103. In 1266, the island became part of Scotland under the Treaty of Perth after being ruled by Norway. 
After a pe period of alternating rules by kings of Scotland and England, the island came under the feudal lordship of the English crown in 1399. The lordship revested into the British crown in 1765, but the island never, never became part of the Kingdom of Great Britain or its successor, the United Kingdom. It retained its status as an internally self-governing crown dependency. So, <laughs> I've not, I've heard about the Isle of Man, how it's meant to be kind of independent, but I didn't realise how independent the Isle of Man really is. Scalia and Cher or Caribidus, be it remembered, lay in the region of the underworld, and as such could never be laid to the charge of Mediterranean Italy or Sicily, but definitely did apply to these parts in Britain. These two maritime dangers were related to, hid to hidden and dangerous currents and reefs in the north passage of St George's Channel, opposite the Rins of Galloway, and we also recollect that the Odysseus was shipwrecked, or Odysseus was shipwrecked on the cruel teeth of Charybidus, and he was saved by floating on a spar until he was thrown up on the shores of Ogygia, the home of Calypso. No scholiast will venture to allege that Ogygia, belonging to Atlas, has any possible connection with the Mediterranean but it decidedly had with British waters. Ogygia had been said to have several historians, including Camden, to have been Ireland, but Homer's Ogygia was a small wooded isle with perhaps what more is right when he associates it with the little island of Gygia of Kintyre, on the ocean, the very spot where the shipwrecked hero carried by the tide in the rapid flowing North Passage could have been easily cast ashore. The North Passage between the Runs of Galloway, the Head of Man, and the Antrim Coast, well answers to the original Sicilian Strait, a few supported by the fact that the southernmost headland of the Saronic Gulf, the Firth of Clyde, was named Skellium Point for the reasons that it lay in the near proximity to those dangerous reefs of Skellia, while on the opposite side, in the swift current, lay the half-submerged Cavernus Chardin, Bidus, which sucked in the tides and spewed them out to the imminent peril of mariners and small ships. It was a hidden dangers of this channel in the distant past which induced many mariners to refer to sail right through the Irish coast to Scotland until quite a late date, as ancient charts indicate, rather than face the perils of the strait. I need, I need to see what that is. Chari Bidis or something. Chari. Uh. Chari Bidis. Ancient Greek pronounced as was a sea monster, later rationalized as a whirlpool and considered a shipping hazard in the Strait of Messina. Jason and Argonauts. Wow. It's a scary beast. But it's... It was probably strong currents, a whirlpool. But they made a myth behind it like it was a monster. But it's just the, the dangers in the sea.
Thucydides, speaking of the danger of the channel between Rigium and Sicily, where lay Charbidus, remarks the narrowness of the passage and the strength of the current that pours in from the vast Tyrrhenian and Sicilian mains have rightly given it a bad reputation. Can we believe for one moment that Thucydides was describing the placid, practically tideless channel between Italy and Sicily, called the Straits of Messina? There are no mains or tides there and cannot ever have been. Applied to the North Channel, it is another matter. We have the immense Atlantic tides and waves that surge around the coast of Ulster from the north and meet those advancing up the Irish Sea from the south. Those are mains. When all the evidence is weighed without prejudice and with understanding, the case is definitely proved that the Trojans, Ascanians or Brigi invaded or occupied Britain and Ireland also at a period before history as such was written and who founded their earliest settlements in the area of Scotland to which they gave the name of Alba or Albany and whence was acquired the later name of Albion. They gave us the kings who reigned as far south as the Wandsdyke below which were the Saxons. They ruled up to a period in Albany but be it observed that from the Firth of Forth to the Cheviots there existed a continuous barrier in the shape of a wall with forts at certain spe specified points called the, the Cat Trail, which separated the kingdom of Albany from the people known to Ptolemy as the Gadini, who ruled in Edinburgh, and were shut off from the Trojans by the Romans in the reign of Hadrian. That the Romans recognised ties of consanguinity, consanguinity between themselves and the Britons were exemplified by a remark attributed to Caesar by Geoffrey of Mammoth. By Hercules, he said, we Romans and these Britons be of one ancestry, for they also come of Roman stock. It may be suggested that when the Trojans from Alba Longa and elsewhere decided to migrate to the shores of the Mediterranean, they took with them certain names which applied to their new homes. The, the Pennines, for example, divide the leg of Italy along its length, as do the Pennines in England. The territories east of the Apennines were named Umbria, as in England they were far, they were f from very ancient times known as Humber. In Italy, Etruria lay west of those same Apennines, as does Lancashire, a region formerly inhabited and from much of the Lancastrian stock is descended. By the Lo Logrians, a small, dark, hardy, and tough people, in fact, Ligures. The, the original Etruscans were said to have been. Pelasgic and their ancient tongue Iberian or Hebrew. The earliest known city of the Etruscans was the seat of the Tarquin kings, and we find, strangely enough, J. B. Roby in his Popular Traditions of Lancashire relating the legend of a giant named Tarquin who dwelt in a strongly fortified castle near Manchester, its site to this day being named Castlefield. These place names could not have been brought to Britain, seeing that the Romans migrated from our islands, but they can have taken them with them. The fact is that the prior history of what became Rome took place in Britain, but it does not take very long when a part of a nation emigrates and especially when few, if any, could read or write before the memory of their earlier home dims and in course of time, so was it with the Romans. They came to attribute their heroic legends to the regions where they finally settled, and this proved by the annexation of such names of Avernus, Ogigia, and Alba, etc. So I think the author here, um, Commons Beaumont, is suggesting that the Romans actually came from Britain and took all the names with them to the Med Mediterranean. Right, I think this could be the last one, Edinburgh and Jerusalem. It is. Appendix C, Jerusalem and Edinburgh. This will be interesting for me, being from Edinburgh. In the reign of David, as shown previously, the Judeans and the followers quitted Hebron in the south and sought a new capital afar off, the Philistines permitting them to depart unmolested. We have seen the critical situation in Jerusalem at the time of the great catastrophe. 
how with the whole earth seemingly in labour, that city, though badly damaged, survived Armageddon. It is unnecessary here to follow that Judean vicissitudes subsequent, subsequently beyond mention of the fact after the Babylonian captivity they were permitted to return to their city across the river. In succeeding centuries, according to Josephus, it appeared that the Jews were friendly with their neighbours, the Spartans or Lacedaemons of Dorian descent, with whom they claimed kingship. You must skip more centuries to a period of the Jews' wars with Rome. It should be noted that in Britain from AD 43, a series of fierce murderous wars ensued between the Britons, notably the Silures and Romans, where more than once the invaders were in tight corners. The hero Caraticus Caradoc held Roman general after Roman general at bay leading the Silures, though not a Silurian himself, in which many battles were waged mostly in southwest Scotland and who was only taken prisoner through the treachery of Queen of Brigantia. From 61 to 71 were critical, crit, critical years in Britain, a period when Jews also were in a state of grave ferment and revolt against the Roman legions, leading to their siege and overthrow during the time the only Roman writer can rely upon is Tacitus, and whose history of the Jews shows the particular interest he took in them. Troops were again brought in from Germany, he tells us, in 61, but the Silures still resisted Roman pacification, destroyed Roman ships and crews, and such was the disorder that Nero called Suetonius, who was detested by the Britons, and sent Polycletus, a freed man, to restore order by kindlier methods. He was held up to ridicule. About 64, Trebilius Maximus became proprietor at Camulodunum, the Roman colonia, now Camelon, by Falkirk who fell out with Roscius Caelius, legate of the 20th legion stationed at Camalodunum, and who finally fled to Vitellius, emperor for a few months, proclaimed by his troops in 69. He appointed Vettius Bellanus as proprietor, from whom he demanded soldiers from Britain to assist him against Vesp Vespasians, Vespasian the latter having been proclaimed emperor in Alexandria. Tacticus says that Bolenus first refused the demand because of inquietude, but later sent the 2nd, 9th and 20th legions, all of which were quartered at Camelodunum, and those records at Camelon have been traced. Thus the real centre of revolt conducted by the Silures lay in the lowlands and in close proximity to Edinburgh, then named differently Julius Frontius subdued the Silures. Edinburgh's had a few different names. Before Edinburgh, it was called um, Dun Eden, Dun Eden. Simultaneously, the Jewish war, mainly guerrilla, raged from 66 onwards until 68 Ves Vespasian was actively engaged in suppressing rebellion in Judea, Galilee and other parts when Nero committed suicide. Vespasian left his son Titus to pacify the Jews and went to Rome then to Alexandria to watch events. Suetonius says that the Vespians served in Germany and then in Britain, where he fought 30 battles against the enemy. We know of his conquests in the south and southwest of Britain, but what of the north and where was the most serious menace to the Roman power existed? We possess one item of interest. Petilius Carelius was made proprietor of Camulundinum as successor to Bolanus by Vespian in 71, after the fall of Jerusalem. He was a man who filled the Britons with terror and fought many battles. Corellius had been a leading general in the siege of Jerusalem in 70, and was entrusted by Titus with the task of storming the tower Antonia and the temple adjoining. A few years earlier, still in Britain, he had been routed by the Silures and had, been, had to flee for his life. Then he is found prominent in the siege of Jerusalem, where he was left in supreme control by Titus, when he sailed to rejoin his father in 71, the very next year, having mean, meantime defeated Claudius Cavillus in Batavia, Holland. He was again in Britain terrorising the natives, the proprietor at Camulodunum. It is possible that this officer could have been rushing from the north of Britain to the present Palestine when communications were slow and dangerous. Or does, or does it not intimate that the fo fourth region in the Silures, Jerusalem and the Jews were closely related to one another. 
Titus offers another problem, as does in fact Vespasian. That serious young man who sent several years with his father in Germany and Britain as Tribunus Militum was given a legion in the Jewish war and captured Jerusalem in September 70 when aged only 29. He was also being transferred from one extremity of the then Roman Empire to another at a time when in Britain almost every tribe or clan was in revolt. It does not make sense. Take one other example. In 134, when Hadrian had suddenly to encounter another furious outbreak of the Jews, he sent Julius Severus, then commanding in York, against them. It is credible that Hadrian, while the Britons themselves were in revolt, selected his commander-in-chief in York, the Roman capital in Britain, and dispatched them to the extremity of the Roman world in present Palestine. By his yet accepted geography, these mili military leaders were being shuffled these great distances, undertaking long voyages, or passing through hostile lands for the purpose. Surely we, we must seek another explanation for such acts. In the year 70, when Jerusalem collapsed, the loss of life was prodigious. Orosius, the ecclesiastical historian, says that Vespian ruled 1,100,000 Jews, slain, starved, or sold in slavery. Josephus placed that figure much higher than he should have known. In the same period, the Asini alone lost 80,000, massacred according to Tacticus. The whole country, and that certainly includes the Clyde and Forth, was aflame against Roman cruelty and tyranny. Yet, strangely enough, in this very year, AD 70, when the Jews were decimated and the Silures brought to utter exhaustion, Tacticus declares that of Diet of Druids, probably an Eistifod, assembled somewhere in Britain, and prophesied the ultimate world empire of the Celts. It was an astonishing prophecy to have been uttered at that moment when Britons were sunk in the depths of despair, yet it was akin to the fantastic and oft-repeated Jewish claim of an expected Messiah who was to obtain for them the hegemony of the world. The hegemony of the world. In 78, with the guerrilla war still continuing in Britain, Agricola arrived and spent most of his time pacifying the nations in the region of the Clyde and Forth Isthmus, where he placed strong garrisons and in 80 wasted, in 80 wasted the Picts lands as far as the Teum, the Tay. In 83, 84, assisted by the Roman fleet, he marched along the Scottish eastern coast, probably reaching as far as the mouth of the Spey, and won a great battle against the Caledons although in those bleak and mountainous parts it gained him little beyond glory. Agricola's movements point inevitably to the restless and danger to the Roman arms in the Isthmus region, and his attacks on the Picts and Scots beyond were a campaign designed more particularly to prevent them from giving aid to the Gadini or, and others. These parts of Britain, south of the Forth, were the original Illyria, or I propose Siluria. In those times, and long before, where are the Lothians, so named after Lot? This is where I live. It's called the Lothians. Edinburgh's in the Lothians. I didn't know they were named after Lot, which is interesting. Who in the Arthurian legend is the king of the Orkneys? Was this tribe called Gadini by Ptolemy? The name recalls not only the relationship of the tribe of Judah with Gad or the Gadites, but also Herodotus appears to have referred to Jerusalem of, as Caditis and to have compared it in size with Sardis, then the greatest commercial city of the world. Apart from the strict watch imposed by Agricola and his successors in these parts of Scotland, placing garrisons in the neighbourhoods of the Bodotra, first of fourth, some 50 years later a queer event happened. The Emperor Hadrian, built a military wall called the Catrail, shutting in the Lothians and Edinburgh. It should be recalled that Hadrian, 117-138, a peaceable emperor, spent much of his time in Britain and he left many traces in York and in other parts in the north. In the 134, he was faced with this determined uprising of the people of Jerusalem with the new Messiah, who held, who held the Romans at bay and fought with them with desperate courage for two years. With his capture of the city and utterly weary of the Jewish priests and politicians whom no generosity or cons consolation could appease, it was said Hadrian ordered the ancient city to be razed to the ground 
and forbade the Jews to approach it under the peril of death except for one day in the year. The very site of Jerusalem was said to be forgotten by the world until Constantine rediscovered it. Hadrian is mainly remembered in Britain in connection with the long wall between the Tyne Mouth and the Solway Firth, but like so many accepted inaccuracies in our history, that was not his wall. Hmm. The Tyne Wall was erected by the Emperor Severus in the 3rd century AD and not mentioned in any record before Notitia 400. It's lengthy. Its length is only 68 miles, but Hadrian's Wall, according to Spartian, was 80 miles long. That emperor, he said, adjusting many things there, was the first to make a wall 80 miles in length to divide the barbarians from the Romans. It could not have been the Antonine or Clyde Forth Trench, only 32 miles in length. The wall in question was that known of the Cat Trail, coming down the centre of the lowlands, of which many traces remain. It enclosed the eastern parts of the Canal or Port Seton, just north of Edinburgh, and descended by way of Gallish Shields, Selkirk, Allen Water, and the rivers Liddell and Esk, a distance of just about 80 miles. It was linked up with a chain of forts, the design being evidently to pen the people inside, the eastern barrier from contact with the friends of Rome. It was related to his war against the Jews. It seems likely that Hadrian personally inspected his great work, for we find his friend, the poet Florus, suggesting his northern visit. No wish have I to be Caesar, to wander through the British lands, and suffer from Scythian frosts. So what of Edinburgh and this connection? Were they the barbarians against whom Hadrian had designs? There are several traces which suggest that old time the people shut in behind the Catrail were the Jews called Gewisi by Geoffrey of Monmouth. Vortigern, an usurper who ruled in these parts, was called the Earl of Gewisi. The people of Albany, aided by the Picts, made war on the Vortigern who had usurped the throne of the British king Constantine and who had seized a part of Albany as well. He retaliated by sending in the Angles of Scandinavia and asking help from the nobles of that nation. In 449, Hengis and Horsa crossed the sea in their long boats and soon sent for their kindred, telling them the feebleness of the inhabitants and the richness of the land. Hengis helped Vortigern to throw back and defeat a large number of Picts from Albany or Fifeshire, and as a guarantee of the future to prevent such forays, the Gewisi prince gave him the land, a castle called Kerkori, by Geoffrey, otherwise Castle Kerry, in the centre of the Antine Wall. Once very strongly fortified, I've never heard of that castle actually. What's it called? The Kerkori, Kerkori, Castle Kerry. That's okay. Castle Kerry is a small market town and civil parish in Somerset, England. Hmm. It's funny because it's still in this area that we're speaking about, even though um, in the book here, Kerkori by Jeff, otherwise Castle Kerry in the centre of the Anton Wall, once very strongly fortified. And the Anton Wall is actually in Scotland, but Castle Kerry, the name still carries on down here. There we go. There we go. This is this is the one. Castle Carry. The site of a Roman fort and annex can be visited at Castle Carry. It is one of only two forts along the wall to have featured stone ramparts. Visible remains include a low mound and portion of exposed stonework from the fort's east rampart. Small portions of these headquarters build buildings near a cluster of trees within the centre of the fort and, depending on the current height of the grass, traces of stonework at the north gate. Right. 
So we found that was that therefore this region inside the Catrail stretching down include much of Northumberland, the county of the Gadeni, the true land of the Jews, whence they trekked, whence they were originally expelled from Wessex country. Gildas, who hailed from Dumbarton, the son of a king, describes Edinburgh as Caer Eden, Civitate Antiquissima, but this most ancient state possessed no known past history, and yet Gildas must have been aware of certain facts to have made so strong a statement. In the triads, 6th century, we are told that Clydno of Edinburgh was slain by the Saxon king Aina at Catareth, Catarich, who, who, as a result, annexed Clydo's city and joined Dynagaith, Dungad, says Watmore, to Bernicia, Northumberland. But in 685, Brudy, king of the Picts in Al Albany, drove the Saxons out of the city, which they call Guthulin, Garan, says Ninanus, translated by Watmore as Gudi al Guarth, or Place of the Jews of Gad. The Venerable Bedi, about AD 700, calls it Gudai, and describes it as a place in the eastern inlet of the ocean which divided the Britons from the Picts, with Al Alcloth, Dumbarton, opposite it in the west. Penda, king of Mercia, lay at the city of Judea, before the Battle of Gai Campi, and Rav Ravenna's, in his list of place names of the 3rd century, calls it Ejudensa, e a combination of Jew or Juden with the river Iska or Esk, east of Edinburgh. There must have been some link subsequently lost or suppressed which related Edinburgh to the city of the Jews in a day when Christianity was in its infancy in the Western world. Geoffrey Geoffrey of Monmouth had some such possible indications when he says in his British Kings what a fabulous monarch named Ibracus founded the fortress of Mount Agne, Edinburgh, in the time of David, and Solomon began to build the temple in the reign of the son of Ibracus. This name, Ibracus, Eber, later Ebracum, he adds, founded also York and Dumbarton. Apart from folklore, Memories there is the interesting problem of Jerusalem and Illyria. St. Paul certainly implies in his epistle to the Romans that Jerusalem stood in the vicinity of Illyria, thus confirming the legends which associated Cadmus, identified as Abram with Illyria, whence his people settled after they had been driven away from Cadmian Thebes, and whose son, Illyrius, was said to have been born among the Enchiles in Illyria. Such ancient traditions meant something. They should not be thrown aside unconsidered. Bosinius seems to allude to Illyria as a land of the Jews, and his fourth book, speaking of the Illyrians who inhabited the coast of Io the Ionian Sea, north of Epirus, he says they overran and subdued the people of Epirus, and a little later he mentions that red water, red as blood, may be seen in the land of the Hebrews near the city of Joppa. Joppa, there's a place. That's, there's a place near Hoik in Scotland called Joppa. After mentioning that the Illyrians built ships and plundered all who fell in their way, how came to mention Joppa, the port of Jerusalem, in connection with the Illyrians unless it was in those same parts? There we go. Joppa. Joppa in Edinburgh. Joppa is an eastern suburb of Edinburgh, the capital of Scotland. It is bounded on the north by the coast of the Firth of the Forth, on the west by Portobello, of which it was a suburb when Portobello was a borough, to the south by the open area south of Milton Road, and to the east by Musselburgh in East Lothian. The name Joppa appears in the late 18th century and is of uncertain origin. One possibility is from the coastal biblical town of Joppa, a Latinization of its 4th century Greek name, Lotan. This is now known as Israeli city of Yafo or Jaffa. Joppa is now largely residential, but salt was once produced from seawater by evaporation at Joppa Pans. So here we go guys, here's, here's another link with Joppa in Edinburgh.
when St Joppa, the port of Jerusalem, in connection with the Illyrians, unless it was were in those parts. What parts? In my previous work I showed su sufficiently for my then purpose of how the Greeks and the Macedonians inhabited Scotland in prehistoric times before they, or some among them, moved down to the Mediterranean. I have shown in this volume how the Trojans came in great numbers to Britain after the Greek catastrophe and formed the state they named Alba or Albania or Brutinum, Brutium. Earlier, Regium, Brutium, being the name accorded it from Brutus, hence our name today, Britain. The Trojan influx is wrapped round the former Greek Epirus, of which Albany was a part, where Brutus is supposed by Geoffrey of Monmouth to have found the posterity of Hellenus, enslaved by Pandrusus, a king of Epirus, from whom Brutus fought at Acalon, the Acherian, now Caron River of Stirlingshire, and defeated. The point I would wish to establish is that where classical geography is concerned, there is frequent confusion between the regions actually affected and those supposed but wrongfully, but wrongly so to have been the area of events. Illyria adjoined Epirus but lay in Britain, in which regions were Alba or Albania and properly Britannum. So we find many names common to both, such as Pandosia, Croton, and the Acheron River. Then there were the region about Falkirk called Damnaya, land of the damned, related, I suggest, to the Holocaust when the Assyrian army before Jerusalem was destroyed as it was nearby Epidamnus, beyond the damned, in the Epirus. The region of Damnia and Acheron was also called Keona, otherwise the place of chaos, these being in the neighbourhood of Edinburgh. Ooh, so I'm living in the city of chaos, guys. Consequently, where Jews dwelt in the Lothians, shut in by Hadrian's Wall, was also Illyria, a name which in the Roman nomenclature in Britain became Siluria. The Silurs, or Tactigas says, or Iberi, or Hebrews, and were also dwelling in Wales. Judea was recognised as the wealthiest vassal state of Rome, and although Jerusalem is preserved in human memory as a sacred city, it was also extremely wealthy and commercial. It was a great port with Joppa at its door, and when it and when overthrown, the rival merchants of Tyre are supposed to have rejoiced. Aha! they chuckled. She is broken at the gate of the people. I shall be replenished now. She is laid waste. Its opulence was proverbial. Created by its bankers, merchants, manufacturers and shipowners, it was famous, says Josephus, for its antiquity, its great wealth and the diffusion of its nation over habitable earth and the veneration paid it for religious reasons. It had a population, according to the same authority, of a million, greatly swollen during the period of Pentecost, when it was visi visited by strangers from all parts, who thronged to the temple, and whose outer cloisters, the money changers, did a roaring trade in exchange of currencies. It was a beautiful city, the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth, exclaims Jeremiah, which fails to find any response in the present Jerusalem, where the topography utterly disagrees in all essential respects with the full details given us by Josephus, who, as the general of the Jews in the War of 70, naturally knew very every inch of the topography and known in only lesser degree to Nehemiah and Ezra. The situation of the present Jerusalem discounts all the claims of commercial and maritime supremacy for, for which it was so renowned. Placed on a high rocky plateau, singularly unfertile, it lies over 35 miles distant from the sea, possesses no river outlet, and its port named Jaffa is only won by courtesy for it possesses no natural advantages and is even then reached the only over difficult hills. Palestine itself, with the exception of a few fertile valleys, mostly towards the coast, composed of limestone mountains or hills, is unsuited for agriculture or pasture and can boast of no minerals whatsoever except potash. These hard facts, quite apart from other evidence, offer Jerusalem little field for world commerce and it would be difficult to find a site less promising for a great commercial city with no raw materials available and no facilities for input. In the present Jerusalem, we are chasing a chimera. It could not possibly have been Rome's wealthiest vassal apart from the fact that its sacred places are totally incompatible with biblical facts and Josephus as I have revealed. On the other hand, ancient Edinburgh and Jerusalem 
tally in every respect. One other sidelight on its position should be mentioned before giving a detailed comparison between Jerusalem and Old Edinburgh. When the Jews, returning after Babylonian captivity, attempted to restore the walls and build Zerubbabel's temple, the Samaritans and others appealed to the Persian kings asking that the records should be searched when it would be proved to have been a seditious city and if rebuilt, said the petitioners to Artax, Ax, Artaxerxes, thou shalt have no portion in the side of the river. Artaxerxes had a search made and sent wrong as follows. It is found that the city of old time made insurrections against kings. There may have been mighty kings also over Jerusalem, which have ruled all beyond the river, and toll, tribute, and custom paid unto him. The river had nothing in common with the river of Iraq, translated as Euphrates, lying across the desert 450 miles east of the present Palestine. It was the ancient eastern boundary of Israel. Solomon, for example, reigned over all the kings from the Perath to the land of Philistines and to the border of Egypt. A light is thrown on this river by the plea of Nehemiah to the king of Persia where he asked, If it has pleased the king, let letters be given to me, the governors beyond the river, that they convey me over until I come to Judah. These words infer something more than merely being ferried over a wide river. They suggest the passage across a broad body of water into a totally different land beyond. We also have a clue from the indication given by Jeremiah, who went to Perath, concealed his girdle in a hole in a rock, and later on a return and to retrieve it found it rotted from the damp sea air. In the book of Judith it speaks of the great strait of Judah. The word river was old, often used in the, to indicate the sea, like the river of ocean. Old Edinburgh, in its topography, its setting, the lay the layout of its principal ancient streets, its winds, its castle rock, its former lakes or locks, its Arthur's seat and its place names offer a most complete comparison with ancient Jerusalem. Both were cities of great age. Ker Eden, Civitate Atequasma, both underwent fearful vicissitudes, both were praised for their matchless beauty and both were the city of the lion. And this is where the... The lion rampant is the, the Scotland's on the Scotland flag. The lion rampant. As far back as 1640, the German traveller Corte, after a complete top, topographical examination of the present Jerusalem, decided that it failed to coincide in any way with the city described by Josephus and the scriptures. Claims that the tombs of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, are buried under a mosque in Hebron, possess no shred of evidence. The rock cut sepulchres in the valley of Je Jehoshaphat and Hinnom are of Roman period with late Greek inscriptions and there exists nothing in groups of ruins at Petra, Sebaste, Baalbek, Palmyra or Damascus or among the stone cities of Haran that are pre-Roman. Nothing in Jerusalem itself can be related to the Jews and its earliest archaeological traces are late Roman. The Reverend Mr Lawson wrote of it in these words. The Jerusalem of modern times is not the city of scriptures. Mount Calvary, now nearly in the centre of the city, was without the walls at the time of the crucifixion, and the greater part of Mount Zion, which is now without, was within the city. The holy places are, for the most part, the fanciful dreams of monkish enthusiasts to increase the veneration of the pilgrims. So we'll have a look at Mount Zion, guys. I've already looked at Mount Zion and it's, it's pretty hilarious. It's, it's not even a mountain. You're lucky if it's even a hill. <clears throat> Mount Zion is a hill in Jerusalem, just outside the walls of the old city. The term Mount Zion has been used in the Hebrew Bible first of the city of David and later for the Temple Mount, but its meaning has shifted and is now used as the name of the ancient Jerusalem's western hill. In a wider sense, the term is also used for the entire land of Israel. The three different locations. <laughs> this Temple Mount. So, so they're, they're probably all fighting over these places that never really existed in the Bible. Have a look at King uh, 
terms of the patriarch thing it's called. Cave of the Patriarchs. The Cave of the Patriarchs, also called the Cave of the Macpella, the Cave of the Double Tombs, and also. On no, I just. Is this a different one? I've been looking at so much stuff that. But even these places, it's very unlikely that um, there were anything to do. See, the Cave of Macpella. Look at that, Macpella. That looks like a Scottish. Who? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, anyway, maybe I should start looking for the places in Edinburgh that maybe match what they're saying in the Bible. In describing the ancient Jerusalem from Josephus mainly, the reader may be referred to the map of Old Edinburgh, which bears both the Edinburgh and the original names relating to Jer Jerusalem. In the Old Jerusalem, the two striking natural features were the Hill of Zion, also called the City of David, or the Citadel, and the Mount of Olives, which dominated it from the east as the Hill of Zion did on the west. It was formerly fortified by three walls, protected in places by swamps, and the circum circumference of the outer walls Strength, strengthened by 90 solid marble towers embraced about four square miles. The hill of Zion, or the citadel, was the highest westward extremity of a long hill, which descended gradually downwards towards the east. It was divided in two below parts named Ophel by a narrow valley or ravine known as the Tyrophoan Valley or Valley of the Cheesemongers, which intersection cut off the citadel and Ophel from the continuum where stood the temple and business residential parts. Josephus refers to call this long intersected hill two hills, of which the lower but longer eastern portion he names Acre, where stood the fortress Antonia, specially constructed to protect the temple of Herod, to cite his own words. The city was built upon two hills opposite one another, and have a valley to divide them asunder at which valley the corresponding rows of houses on both hill ends. Of these hills, of which contains the upper city, is much higher and in length, and in length direct. The other, which was called Acre, and sustained the lower city, is in the shape of a horned moon. Is of the shape of a horned moon. Over against this, opposite, was a third hill, naturally lower than Acre, and parted firmly from the other hill by a broad valley. The third hill separated from the lower hill or Acre by a broad valley lay to the south of Acre. Later as Josephus explains as the population increased a fourth hill north of Acre named Bezitha became incorporated and this was separated from the old city by a deep valley ravine. To summarise the foregoing Jerusalem in AD 70 lay from east to west mainly occupying one very long hill broken into two with the citadel in the west and the temple near the western summit of the eastern half, or, if we adopt Josephus' description, two hills continuous but broken by a narrow valley, a third hill with a broad valley between it, an acre and a fourth hill across a ravine to the north. The main hill or two hills might be a co compared with a huge decapitated decap dragon or lizard, its head lying in the west where the citadel or city of David towered over the rest of the city its neck formed by the Mount Ophel in the upper market place. When came the Tyrophian Valley, Ty Tyropoean Valley, which decapitated the monster, after which followed the carcass, including the Temple of Acre and its backbone, a wide street from that time of humpbacked contour, Joseph Horn Moon, Joseph, Jef Josephus Horned Moon, its greatest height called Mount Moriah, where stood the temple after which it gradually sloped downwards until it reached a level ground not far distant from the foot of the Mount of Olives. From either side of this long hill, steep and narrow streets went down the valleys below, but much more precipitous on the north side. Precip pre precipitous on the north side. Precipitous. Nothing in present Jerusalem bears the slightest resemblance to, to topographically with the above description. 
and does not extend east and west so much as north and south, but is all lumped together, uphill and downdale. There is no height to compare even remotely with the citadel or city of David. All the sites are in dispute except that topographers agree to the place the site of the temple, where now stands the mosque of Omar, the highest commanding area in the city, where Josephus makes it beyond doubt that it was occupying a site far lower than the citadel and stood some distance from it. The temple with the front Antonia, built by Herod, occupied a space of six furlongs, say Josephus, whereas the area available for the mosque of Omar is under two furlongs. Bezitha, the fourth hill, is included inside Nehemiah's walls in the northeast corner, but it was a separate hill divided completely from Acre by the ravine known as Jesophat's Valley, and there was the pool of Bethesda and its healing waters. Other displacements in the present so-called Jerusalem are that the valley of Hinnom, associated with Golgotha and Calvary, is placed in the south, but all three lay in the west. The Jaffa Gate, same as the Fish Gate, is located in the west, but was really in the northeast of the city. The tomb of David is placed outside the walls, south of the, of the Armenian quarter, although Josephus made it plain that this that his tomb, like Hezekiah's and other kings, rested in the city of David and hidden subterranean tombs, none of which have ever been discovered in modern times. Before proceeding to compare the detailed topography of Jerusalem with Edinburgh, street by street, it will assist clearness of understanding if a brief description is first given of the Jewish city from the Mount of Olives situated on the east of it. Inside the walls, the old city, Acre, proceeded from the near Watergate to rise towards the west in a long hump-backed extension, with the streets emerging on either side, on that north having steep winds down the valley of Josephat and the pool of Bethsida. On the south, declining to the vale beyond where lay the third hill in Josephus' account, the main street, East Street, was the home of the bankers, merchants and businessmen and passed onward to the lower marketplace and thence to the high, which led directly by the street of the house god, Ezra, namely the broad place where stood the temple of the highest site, Moriah, its great por portico facing the Mount of Olives to the highest site, to the east, or rise, uh, sun rising, sorry. Then followed the residences and edifices of high officials or priests until the hill came to a sudden termination by the narrow ravine. This ravine, to continue, named the Typorian or Cheesemonger's Valley, cut a wedge between the city so far described and the upper city, which was originally reached only by steps from the valley below. The continuation of the upper city led first to the upper marketplace, followed by a long broad area named Ophel or Mount Ophel, standing too steeply for the streets to descend from it and to the level ground below. Its area was covered with habitations where appeared to have mainly dwelt the higher ranks of priests, Levites and Nethanim. As far as the great bastion of the city of David or Hill of Zion or the citadel and separated from Ophel by a moat called Milo where stood the barbaric entrance to the city of David. Or, sorry, no barbaric, Barbican. Barbican. And Barbican. The city of David, so called because there he built his palace or house, or hill of Zion, or God, where David set up his tabernacle, was an almost impregnable fortress, although it was accompanied, accompanied variously by Chaldeans, Persians, Syrians, Macedonians, Parthenae, and lastly by the Romans, as well as more than once by belligerent high priests. It stood on a high, precipitous rock on three sides almost unscalable. The Jezebites laughed at David when he endeavoured endeavoured to capture it, but Joab found an entry, and David took the castle of Zion, which is the city of David. Surmounted by high walls and towers, the king's palace emerged above the great tower that leeth out, and dominated Ophel and the temple beyond. We learn that after David captured the citadel, he erected a very strong wall around its summit, enlarged the moat Milo. Beyond Milo and the Barbican entrance stood, says Josephus, besides the king of high palace courts, the house of elders, four strong towers, baths, a guard's house, a prison, dungeons, barracks, the house of Zion and other buildings beside the tombs of the kings. Not a sign of the hill of Zion can be traced in this present Jerusalem, and yet every statement made herein is directly drawn from Josephus or the scriptures. Other points relating to the city demand mention, 
The pool of Bethesda possessed certain chemical qualities and, and was used for bathing by many. Jerusalem enjoyed a sufficient water supply apart from cisterns and the brook Kedron, including the pool of Siloam. When Hezekiah flooded Milo, he drew in all the fountains or lakes and the brook Kedron that ran through the mists of the land. He also stopped the upper water course of Gion on the Mount of Olives and ran its waters by a conduit by the west side of the city of David. The pool of Bethesda, Bethesda lay near the sheep gate to the northeast, was of considerable size and was surrounded by a colonnade. Today, the Birkit Israim, uh, Israim, a small pond, usually dried up, is supposed to respond to it. Sol Silom lay in the south, towards the southwest, near the fountain gate, in the southern end of the Tyropean Valley, and was another large body of water forming the chief supply until Pontius Pilate laid an aqueduct over some 20 miles, of which no traces remain. Today, Salom is pointed out as a small pool about 18 feet in extent containing brackish water which usually dries up in the hot months. Having given description of the real Jerusalem, I will now proceed to identify the principal landmarks of it with those of Edinburgh. The identification between the two will be seen to be remarkable in every way comparison is possible in view of changes in the ages. Oh my god, how many pages left? Right guys. There's not many, um, not much left, just a few pages to go, but I think I'll end it here then now. And um, I'll do the comparisons of Jerusalem with Edinburgh in my next sitting, I think, guys. Thanks for coming along. Like I said, I, I just want to get this book out of the way before I can go into other videos. Um, and I might just finish this today because like I said, I've not got much time for the rest of the week and maybe even next week. So I'll try to take advantage of my spare time. Right, guys, I hope you have a good day. Take care. See you later.